my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you that what I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they, they answered. You were Abraham's children, said Jesus. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my... Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Jesus claims about himself. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed. I'm not possessed by demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and, your dis and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never test death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I, I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they say to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they, pick my, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, sleeping away from the temple grounds. Right. Well, if you want to uh, grab your Bibles and uh, turn back to the passage that was read to us just now uh, from uh, John chapter 8, if you've got the church Bible, it's on page uh, 1074. Uh, my name's uh, Tim. Uh, I'm 
I'm working as one of the pastors here uh, in the church and it's my privilege to explore this passage uh, together uh, this morning and we're particularly focusing in on the second half of John chapter 8 that was read the sentence is numbered uh, 31 uh, through to the end uh, to 59 and as we do so well we have something deadly serious to consider Uh, the things that uh, uh, Jesus says here lead some to accuse him of being deluded utterly mad Uh, some uh, even accuse him of being demon possessed uh, terribly bad but Jesus repeatedly insists he's not mad or bad but God Uh, and you see this uh, particularly as the passage ends uh, with Jesus using one of the special Old Testament names for God I am Uh, and this so obviously is a claim by Jesus uh, to be God himself that uh, the people listening uh, take this as the greatest insult and blasphemy and they pick up stones uh, to stone Jesus to death which may well have been uh, justified uh, if Jesus wasn't who he is claiming to be Uh, so uh, it's a question that's been asked uh, many times But is Jesus mad, bad, or God? And why does this matter so much? Because, well, if Jesus is a deluded madman or a dishonest bad man, then the things he says here can be just dismissed and ignored. But if not, then Jesus demands that we honor and hear him as the God man and as he makes clear uh, that's the only way that we're going to accept the the life-giving truth that and reality that he invites us into in this passage uh, a truth that Jesus claims will set you free uh, so as we consider this section be asking yourself are these the words of a deluded madman a a dishonest bad man or the deliverer god man the one who has come to set us free and this this passage uh, it naturally divides uh, into two sections and so in the sentences uh, 31 to 47 i want us to see what it is that god sets us free from Uh, and then secondly in the sentences uh, 48 to 59 i want us to see what it is that god sets us free for so what he sets us free from and what he sets us free for Well, Jesus begins by uh, addressing some of the Jews who we're told in the previous sentence, verse 30, had just come to believe in him. Now, whatever belief they have, uh, it's clear that these people as yet are not true committed followers of Jesus. Uh, You can see that by uh, both the way things pan out in this passage Uh, but also because Jesus now wants to make it clear what is involved in being a real disciple of his. Uh, Do you want to know what it is to be a real disciple of Jesus? Well, he tells us, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. And that word hold is a very strong word it means to embrace and take to heart to to abide and remain in Uh, you can of course believe something in your head and kind of agree and accept that it is true without that sinking in and taking effect in your heart and life 
Uh, the truth that uh, we need to hear about Jesus has to lodge deep within us. It has to, it has to grip uh, and captivate us. We have to hold to it so that it utterly changes us and the things in our hearts that we love and that we are loyal to, our affections and our allegiances. Now, only when belief goes from the head to the heart will we hold, will we remain and abide and, and live in and live out of Jesus' teaching. And it's then, Jesus says, that you will know the truth. Know it in your actual experience and inner being rather than just as some idea and intellectual thing that we give a nod of approval to. We'll know it and as such the truth will set you free. Now this is an amazing claim that Jesus is making. And I don't know how you are responding to it. Perhaps like uh, these people here, initially you're wondering, you're perhaps even concerned uh, about this idea of being set free. Because that implies that you're being held captive. That you're kind of in slavery and bondage. And these people protest. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? I don't suppose any of us have, have literally been slaves. Uh, when we uh, lived in Guernsey, uh, May the 9th every year was Liberation Day. Uh, you may know that uh, Guernsey is one of the, the Channel Islands off the coast of France, and uh, the Channel Islands were the only part of the British Isles to be occupied by German forces uh, during World War II. And the people of Guernsey, uh, along with uh, many others from different nationalities who were brought into the island as forced labourers, they endured five year long years of occupation. They, they didn't have any way to, to free themselves. They were looking for rescue from outside of their shores. And in the end, on May the 9th, 1945, a day after uh, the rest of Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the local German forces surrendered, and much to the, the joy and celebration, uh, the island finally was liberated. And to this day, you can still feel a sense of, of relief and appreciation at being free. And that annual Liberation Day, it genuinely is celebrated with real heartfelt thanks. Now, there it is obvious that the people were captives in need of rescue. But how are we Slaves and in bondage and captivity. Perhaps like the people here, you are thinking in these outward, physical senses about the kind of things that were happening in Guernsey. But while it's a very powerful picture, Jesus wants us to understand this spiritually and inwardly. He replies, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who sins is a uh, sorry, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Uh, sin, corruption, waywardness within has gripped and it is holding our hearts captive. Uh, the, the Bible is it is very clear that the control center of our lives is our heart. Uh, that it's from within that we, we choose and are motivated to, to think and speak and, and act. And, and the truth is that all of our hearts have been captured and captivated by something other than God. We were made to, to love God. 
with all our heart and, and soul and, and strength and mind. And, and with that and flowing from that to love our neighbour as ourselves. And yet other loves and loyalties have captured our hearts. Uh, for me, all too often, it's the love of other people's approval and acceptance or, or the love of comfort and ease or a kind of upside-down love of money. Uh, earlier in the summer, uh, Dorcas and I uh, managed to lock ourselves inside our conservatory. It was quite a hot day. Uh, our nephew uh, was staying with us and uh, we'd gone into the conservatory for a bit of peace and, and quiet and we shut the door behind us without thinking, without really realising that it could only be opened from the inside because it had a latch uh, in, inside the house. Now thankfully uh, we had our phone with us and so Dorcas said, well, let's just phone upstairs to our nephew and get him to come down and let us out. But such is my heart that I really, really didn't want Dorcas to do that. I didn't want to be shown up and appear stupid in front of my nephew. And actually, that was holding me captive more than the physical locked door. The, the solution was easy and, and right at hand, uh, and actually Dorcas did just phone anyway, and uh, we quickly were let out, but that sense of shame and embarrassment was so strong and, and powerful that it, it was controlling what I was prepared or not prepared to do. And that was my heart with its misplaced love and loyalty, wanting approval, wanting acceptance, wanting to, to keep face. That was it being hijacked. My heart was, it was taken over by those desires, taken over by those wayward loves. And I was living out of it with bad consequences. At other times, my love of comfort and ease, uh, it has me putting off jobs that I don't like or, or find hard because I, I resist and, and push away things that are inconvenient, things that I don't like. I try to, to make my life run as smoothly and easily and often as cheaply as I can, even if that isn't what is best for my neighbour and honouring to God. And other times I just operate out of pure lust or, or greed or anger with those th things flaring up with such force that I'm able to even to push past kind of outward restraints and just live out of those things. In all those ways, I see that my heart is captured, that it is enslaved to sin, to, to, to my inward corrupt desires, my, my wayward uh, desires and, and love within. That sin is loving anything more or instead of loving God with all my heart and soul and strength and mind and, and loving my, say, uh, my neighbor as myself and what I need what we all need it is what Jesus says in sentence 36 so if the son with a capital S for the God man uh, Jesus if the son sets you free you will be free indeed I need to be freed from the things, from the sins that, that hold my heart captive, that, that make me choose wrong things and, and say wrong things and think wrong things, that those misplaced loves and, and loyalties within, my, my wayward, corrupt affections and allegiances that, are, that so grip me and, and control what I do. Like the people of Guernsey, there, there is nothing that I can do to, to free myself 
from this inward bondage and slavery. My, my misplaced loves and loyalties of heart are so ingrained and entrenched that I can't break free. I can't get rid of them. Only Jesus, only he can change my heart. Only he can forgive what is wrong and, and wash and, and give me a clean heart that, that holds to his teaching in that deeply lodged, committed, abiding way that has a new love and a new loyalty for him. Now, sadly, these people here, we're told, had no room for Jesus' word, this, this truth that would set them free. That they wouldn't acknowledge that they were slaves to sin, with hearts held captive by other things than God. Uh, they thought, actually, that because of their status at birth, that they were descendants uh, of Abraham, that they were different, that they were better than others. In, in fact, they thought they did freely, by their own choice and efforts, love God and, and love their neighbor, despite the evidence to the contrary. And so Jesus has to spell things out using even more graphic language. Now he begins to drop in a, a quite terrifying truth in, in sentence 41. Uh, to these people who thought they were doing God's will, he says, you are doing the works of your father. Uh, clarifying what he means in, in, in sentence uh, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. You see, while these people and, uh, and us as well were, were made to be children of God, you, you may remember the, the story of Adam and Eve in, in the earliest days of human history. Now, the Bible tells us that their hearts, uh, and ever since our hearts, were captivated and captured by the devil's lie, by his evil, murderous scheme. Uh, that lie that, in essence, promised us that, that we can be gods, that we can live just as we want without reference to the true God. Uh, and our hearts love this lie. Uh, and we side with, with Satan, and we're complicit in this rebellion. Uh, and every time we, we live out of our heart's desire to, to please and promote ourselves and, and disregard and disrespect God, we're showing our true colors and the real love and, and the loyalty of our hearts. That, that while it is our own desires... It is perhaps unwittingly in line and, and league with Satan. And in that sense, we are more children of the devil than we are children of God. Now, it's not that we're demon-possessed or that we're under some overt demonic power. It is a matter of our heart's allegiance, of, the, of our hearts being captured and captivated by the devil's lies. Our hearts are in the grip of this. They're corrupted. They're wayward. They're one to a cause that we think is great. That the pushing out of God as the rightful ruler of this universe and of our individual lives. We need our hearts to, to be set free from our, our slavery to sin and, and to living in the grip of this lie, this, this murderous scheme of the devil. So that our hearts are no longer captivated and complicit in this, but are set free again to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this brings us to consider what we are set free for. Now, as we do that, we're, 
we need to remember that these words, that this, this view that, that can sound harsh, can sound shocking, is the view of, of the God-man, not a, not a madman or a bad man. Already in the sentences we've looked at, Jesus has been emphasizing that, that he is telling us what he's seen in the presence of his Father. Uh, the truth that he has heard from God, uh, that he has come here from God, that he's been sent by him. And, and while we're in the, the grip of the devil's lie, and as it were, we belong to him, Jesus makes it clear that we just don't want to hear. We don't want to accept his truth. He ends this, this first section we've been looking at with a sentence 47 saying, whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Again, it's this matter of belonging, of allegiance, of the affections, the love, the loyalty of our hearts. We listen to, we hear who we love and, and we want to hear from. And, and at hearing this, the, the people are incensed. And, and as we so often do when we get angry and upset, they just resort to insults and, and petty name-calling. Aren't we right in, in saying you are a Samaritan, a term for a, a half-breed, ignorant, madman? And that you're demon-possessed, someone who truly is a, a bad man. But again, Jesus is clear. He's the God-man. He's honoring his Father in heaven while they are horribly dishonoring and disrespecting him. Not that Jesus, he says, is seeking honor and reputation and, and glory. His heavenly Father will see to that because his Father, he says, is judge who will ultimately condemn and punish all who continue in their rebellion, who remain slaves to sin and under uh, the grip of the devil, refusing the rescue, refusing the freedom that Jesus is offering. But those who are listening to what Jesus is teaching and, and are seeing their need for rescue, recognizing their plight uh, as slaves to sin and, and going to Jesus, asking for that way of escape, whose hearts are, are being changed so that we, we hold to his teaching as, as real disciples. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says, Whoever obeys my word in this way will never see death. Now again, those listening take this in a very physical, literal, outward way and it becomes a, another reason to ridicule and dismiss Jesus. Whereas Jesus is again talking in a spiritual, inward sense. If we hold to, if we remain in the grip of our slavery and sin, then we are killing ourselves. Our lives will end in, in judgment and, and condemnation at the hands of Jesus' Father. Whereas if we're, if we're prized away, if we're released from the grip of these things, if, if the affections and the allegiance, the loves and loyalty of our hearts are, are once more turned and, and set on loving God and loving our neighbor, no matter how feebly and inconsistently we live that out, then we will be spared death and condemnation. And we will be set free into this abundant life of righteousness and peace that Jesus is promising to us. We are set free for life, for righteousness and joy. We need to, to focus on far more than just what we are set free from. We need to know what we are set free 
halfway through uh, sentence uh, 54, Jesus says, My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his words. And what Jesus is, is rejoicing in there, knowing his father, obeying his words, that sums up what we have been set free for. To know God. To obey his word. As primarily we hear that word. To, to love him and love our neighbour. As that, as that sums up all that God wants of us. In our slavery, we don't know. We don't belong to God as Jesus is teaching here. And as such, we've no desire to obey and, and live out his words. But that changes when our hearts are set free. Gladly and, and willingly, we, we put ourselves under the lordship of Jesus and we live to know him and obey him and, and make him known. Now perhaps you're wondering and thinking, well, that doesn't sound much like freedom. Belonging to another, obeying his words. Well, that's where we have to understand that, that freedom is so much more than just being set free from something or, or someone. It is being set free for something or someone. Th this is what we were made for. To know God. To live out his word as he, as he tells us how to live. Principally as we're, we're told that we're to, to love him and love our neighbour. That, that's the way God sets things up so that we flourish as people, so that we live fulfilled, fruitful lives. Think of when uh, anyone makes a, a product, how it comes with an instruction uh, manual. Uh, the designer, he sets out what it is that will get the most out of the product, how to care for it, how to, how to get it to do what it is meant to do. If you don't follow those instructions, then the product's likely to break or, or go wrong. And similarly, God is telling us how it's best to live, how we are to flourish and be fruitful. And that is by knowing him in a deep and intimate relationship and living according to his word. In his word, God sets out the safe boundaries to live in, the confines in which we are to operate. And that isn't oppressive and restrictive. That is setting us free, setting us going to, to operate at our best, to live according to our maker's instructions within the loving boundaries that he set for us in, in a personal an ever-deepening relationship with him. That's what we were made for. And that's what Christ sets us free to enjoy. And people down through the centuries have appreciated that this is the way to live a fruitful, fulfilling life. Including those who lived in the Old Testament period, who were looking forward uh, to Jesus is coming. Uh, and Jesus here particularly highlights Abraham because that was the, the person these first century Jews most looked up to and uh, identified with. And he tells us in, in, in sentence 56, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Now again, the people hear this and they, they mock and, and ridicule Jesus, saying, well, you're not 50 years old. How can you have seen Abraham, who, who lived centuries before? But 
but when this is where people have to realize that we're not speaking and hearing a, a madman or a bad man, but the God man. Because with all sincerity, with all certainty, Jesus is able to make this extraordinary claim. Before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus identifies himself as the ever-existent, uh, ever-self-existent uh, 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 God. And the one who, who brings everything else into existence. Not only does he, he predate Abraham, he predates everyone and everything else. He's always existed as the second member of, of the triune Godhead, as God the Son, alongside God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Again, I don't know what you're, you're making of this claim. But for these uh, Jews here, this was just too much. And it's at this point that they pick up stones to, to throw at Jesus. But I think in an uh, amazing and somewhat amusing way, Jesus demonstrates exactly what it is that he's claiming here, that he is God who can set us free. Because he just walks away from this threat as a, a free man. He hides himself in, in plain sight and just slips through the crowd and out of the temple grounds. Uh, we have to make our, our own decisions about Jesus. Is he a deluded madman? Is he a dishonest bad man? Or is he the great delivering God-man who has come to set us free. And of course this one can set us free. He made us and he can remake us. He can reach into the very depth of our being, into our hearts, the, the control center of our life. And he can turn us around and give us new affections and allegiances, new loves and loyalties, so that we, we begin to love him and love our neighbor as we were made to do. And that change of heart is, is absolutely vital because we go awry whenever we love and are loyal to other things, whenever we're, we're held and bound by those things and, and we don't choose God. That's what, from birth, we've been a slave to. Under the dominion of Satan, complicit and captivated by his rebellion and wanting to dethrone God from his rightful place as king of the universe and of each one of us. That plays out in all sorts of ways. And it leads to our judgment and condemnation. Jesus will set us free from this, changing and himself captivating our hearts so that we're freed from judgment and condemnation and freed for eternal life where we know and enjoy God as we, as we love and, and serve him and love our neighbor as ourselves. That, that setting free is both decisive and it's progressive. And when we're given a new heart, we, we begin for the first time to truly love and be loyal to God. Wanting to love him with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. And wanting to love our neighbor as ourselves. There's a, there's a noticeable and a, a real change. And yet old love's and loyalties will remain and, and resurge uh, at times. And we'll not instantly love God or our neighbor as we should. Other things will try and recapture our hearts and our affections. But unlike before, we do now know God. And deep down, we do want to obey God. And we have his word and his spirit. 
He comes close and gradually, sometimes falteringly, he, he helps us free from those wrong things, growing a, a new love, a new loyalty for him so that we live fruitful and, and flourishing lives while still troubled by our old loves and loyalties. The Son, he does set us free. And we are free indeed. As we know the truth, not just in our heads, but as it transforms our hearts, that truth will set us free. Amen.